TXRX Systems has been producing equipment for use in LAN mobile radio since 1976. Products are used to enhance the transmit and receive characteristics of base station and repeater sites to give portables, mobiles, and handhelds better range and capabilities, to reduce the number of feed lines on the tower, reduce tower loading, to monitor power levels and feed line health, and many other applications. Section 3 of this material will cover additional equipment used at sites. TXRX Systems has a long history with transmit and receive site equipment and offers some of the most advanced and reliable components available. This training module will cover the basics of site systems, technology, and application. More detailed information will be included in further sections. Land Mobile Radio Overview Section 3 is an introduction to LMR site equipment and will include the topics listed on this index. For quick reference, you will find information for the topics listed at the numbered slide pages. In previous sections, we have covered major categories of site equipment, including antennas, filters, combiners and duplexers, TTAs and RMCs, isolators and circulators, control station combiners, transmission line, and connectors. Every part of the system must work together, and the engineer or technician will be better equipped to handle system design, installation, optimization, and troubleshooting with the proper approach and training. In this section, we will look at filters and second harmonic filters, couplers, splitters and crossband couplers, and lightning suppressors. As before, we will not go into detail on any one of these topics. And for more details, look for other topics posted on the TXRX website, txrx.com, under the Resources menu. Many factors impact coverage from transmitter power output or TPO, height above average terrain or HAAT, the frequency range of the system, system gains and losses and system balance, and some things can be controlled and some cannot. Site placement in certain types of terrain, city sites versus open flat country, statewide networks versus township police, all have their peculiarities to be accounted for. All parts in the system need to be tested for impedance match to see if they meet system expectations. Some problems can be controlled through proper design and installation, but some things that impact coverage may not be controllable. Sight noise and interference may be present from the first day or may be introduced later. Operator and operational errors occur pointing to the need for operator training. Be careful to include these in your list of troubleshooting items. Cavity type filters were covered during the combiner training modules, but will be reviewed briefly here. TXRX Systems was founded and built around cavity filters and their uses in communication systems. Cavity filters are a very flexible product, being adaptable to many different applications. Bandpass series notch and very notch filters are all constructed from the same outer shell or cavity and are changed in their response by changing the coupling loops used. Three types of loops are shown with an example of a filter response curve and each has specific applications. Rotating the loops in their mounting sockets changes the coupling of the cavity while adjusting the cavity's tuning rod length changes the frequency response. A bandpass loop has a single connector on it, with one end connected to the signal source on the center pin and the other end of the loop connected to the plate or ground. The response is a simple bell curve as shown, with the least amount of rejection or loss at the peak of the curve and more attenuation or reflection off center. Two loops are used in bandpass cavities, one on the input and one on the output to allow signal to pass through the cavity. The series notch loop is used to block or notch out signals by tuning for high impedance at the notch frequency. The loop has two connectors and a tuning capacitor, allowing the notch to be adjusted in depth. Basic tuning is performed with the tuning rod assembly. The very notch loop has two connectors and a small tuning capacitor like the series notch. 
This allows the loop to be tuned for a band pass and an adjacent notch. A single loop is used for each very notch cavity. The tuning capacitor is adjusted to change the notch frequency after the cavity is tuned using the tuning rod. Land mobile radio system receivers typically have a very wide front end, allowing a lot of bandwidth in. This lets a lot of non-system channels or frequencies into the receiver and can easily cause the receiver to desense depending on the strength of the signals. Filters are used to protect receivers and their sensitivity and to eliminate noise generated by transmitters. Pre-selectors and post-selectors are made up of various filters depending on how much protection is needed and the expected power levels of the incoming signals using band pass or notch filters as required. Pre-selectors are used in front of system receivers, usually before multiple receivers. They are window filters, allowing a specific range of frequencies in. These filters usually aren't as large and don't have a high power handling capability, since they are usually working at receive power levels. Due to lower power levels, smaller cavity or comb line filters may be used, taking up less space but offering a good filter response. Pulse selectors are filters used after a transmitter or transmit combiner to reduce amplifier noise. Transmitters produce a lot of wideband noise and can cause interference to their own or other systems receivers. These filters must be able to handle the power levels of the transmitters or the combined output following a system combiner. TXRX Systems builds pulse filters using standard cavities or milled aluminum cavities. As in all systems currently, components with multiple carriers going through them must be PIM rated, capable of carrying the signals without producing harmful passive intermodulation levels. TXRX manufactures circulators, isolators, and the filters needed when using them. In electronics and RF, the term nonlinear junction is used many times in the explanation of intermodulation and harmonics, both of which are produced when a signal or several signals pass through a nonlinear junction. A nonlinear junction is the point where two different or dissimilar materials touch and a signal goes through that junction. At that point, the mixing of signals occurs and other signals are produced. Nonlinear devices include some electronic components like diodes and transistors or electrical mechanical devices such as the isolators used in nearly all radio systems. Isolators are nonlinear because they use multiple layers of metallic ceramic material, the ferrite pads, with layers of magnetic material and steel plates. They produce second and other even order harmonics and when those signals mix with other signals, they can and will produce third order and other IM products. Second order filters are used to control the harmonics produced in the isolators. While second and other even order harmonics may not be a problem for your system, they are harmful to other systems and are in violation of FCC rules in the United States and other regulatory bodies around the world. The filter should be installed between the isolators and the antenna. They may not be needed on the combiner side of the isolator as combiners themselves provide the necessary filtering. The filters are available in several attenuation values in the 30 to 60 dB range and are typically used on hybrid combiners. TXRX manufactures single and dual section filters for applications where bandpass cavities are not used. TXRX Systems builds couplers that come in many varieties and will be covered more completely in another training module. But for now, we will look at common types, their uses, and limitations. A coupler is created when two conductors are placed close enough to each other that part of the signal is transferred to the second conductor through capacitive or inductive coupling. The distance between the conductors, surface area of the conductors, and other factors will determine how much of the signal is coupled. 
with a non-directional coupler, signals in a transmission line are coupled in either direction, forward from source to load, or in reverse from load to source. Directional couplers will couple signals in one direction only, or to the directionality specification limit. The properties of a directional coupler can also be used to separate signals flowing in opposite directions in a transmission line. A directional coupler can be used to divide power going to multiple locations or to combine power from multiple sources. Couplers have four ports or connectors, as shown on the diagram. Port 1 is usually the input port, with port 2 as the output or through port. Port 1 to port 2 is the main or through line, which carries the signal. Port 3 is the coupled port. Port 4 has a load attached which absorbs signals going to that port. Port 4 can also be called the isolated port. A percentage of the signal traveling from port 1 to port 2 will be present at port 3, and a percentage of the signal going from port 2 to port 1 will be present at port 4. Crossband couplers allow frequencies from multiple bands to be coupled into a common broadband feed line, to an antenna, or to another system. This lowers the number of feed lines going up the tower, reducing wind loading and weight, and saving the expense of multiple feed lines. Antennas typically are not broadband enough to handle multiple frequency bands, so a second coupler will be needed on the tower to split the signals to the appropriate antenna. The units for tower mounting are supplied by TXRX in a waterproof enclosure. TXRX power dividers are built to handle higher power output levels while providing equal power splits. Signals coming in on the input port or port 1 are evenly split on ports 2 and 3 at the outputs. Hybrid splitters usually result in 20 dB of port-to-port -port isolation and send signals to receive systems at 20 dB or more port-to-port -port isolation. Models are broadbanded, typically covering two or more frequency ranges for flexible coupling. Wilkinson power dividers result in even splits 3 dB below the incoming signal. Like most power dividers, Wilkinson power dividers can be used as combiners when equal power levels are coming in on what would normally have been the output ports. These splitters can be manufactured on printed circuit boards or by using coaxial cable lengths equal to one quarter wavelength of the incoming signal. To keep the impedance balanced, a resistor is added across the output connectors, yielding a 50 ohm match regardless of how the ports are terminated. With coaxial type couplers, there is little port to port isolation, but power handling capabilities make them ideal for use in distributing transmitter power. Coaxial splitters come in several different layouts, including very simple designs of printed circuit board traces laid next to each other with the size of the traces determining the power handling capability. Coaxial splitters are similar to Wilkinson dividers, but do not use a balancing resistor. Coaxial splitters must be terminated in 50 ohms to present an even split and proper match. TXRX RF signal samplers are used to take a very small part of the signal out of a system in order to display it on a spectrum analyzer or other piece of test equipment. These couplers tend to be non-directional and are specified in 10 dB increments. Sampling values are available at 20, 30, 40, and 50 dB. Insertion loss is very low, usually under 1 dB. One of the most common uses for signal samplers is for spectrum analyzers, looking for noise or interferers. Samplers are put in the main transmission line on either the transmit or receive path. By attaching a spectrum analyzer, the system can continue to operate while the technician looks for distortion, IM, harmonics, or noise. This allows the monitoring of live conditions, live signals, live problems. Samplers are rather broadband, covering multiple ranges and power levels. Lightning, with its megajoules of power flowing in milliseconds, tends to reduce some components to carbon, making grounding and lightning protection necessities of life for land mobile radio sites. 
lightning or surge protectors must be installed anywhere there are active components installed such as tower top amplifiers. Lightning arresters primary job is to protect, receive and transmit equipment, but they protect everything in the path as well. Lightning suppressors have installation specifications that must be met for successful system protection. And although designed to take lightning strikes, the suppressor will be damaged or destroyed by a direct hit. One lightning arrestor company talks about their component's job to sacrifice in order to protect equipment. Lightning strikes result in a broadband pulse, often mistaken as a DC pulse. Most of the energy in the strike is low frequency, but it produces enough power in all frequencies to destroy equipment. Some lightning arresters are frequency specific when swept, look like a filter response. Others may be more broadband. The sweep on the slide shows that insertion loss is lowest within the passband of the unit. The primary goal is to limit the amount of energy entering the system through any access point. This includes the complete grounding of all racks and equipment in the shelter. It is highly recommended that all technicians working on installing equipment take a class in proper site grounding. A site in Florida was continuously losing receive equipment. All lightning arresters were in place and installed properly, but the receivers were continuing to have their front ends blown out. During a site grounding audit, it was found that the halo, the top grounding strap, was floating. It was not grounded. The purpose of the halo and other site grounding is to ensure that the potential of all equipment remains the same during lightning strikes. Without the halo grounded, the potential of some of the equipment was significantly different than other pieces of equipment, causing damage. Proper grounding of the halo fixed the problem. Lightning strikes near the site were pulsing the halo, causing an electromagnetic pulse to be sent into the equipment, destroying the receivers. Lightning arresters will be included in this material, but TXRX Systems does not manufacture lightning or surge protection devices, but does use them in site equipment. Just as there are several types of lightning arresters and surge protectors, there are multiple manufacturers of components. We do not endorse one manufacturer over another. Polyphaser is a division of Infinite Electronics International and offers a full range of protection devices for DC and AC electrical installations through RF. Times Microwave manufactures cables and connectors, test equipment, cable assemblies, and lightning protection devices. Cytel produces surge protection, including DC and AC through RF systems. For the high power protection needed to protect from lightning and other high EMP sources, there are basic types of lightning arresters in combination or hybrids of those. Gas discharge tubes, quarter wave coaxial shorted stubs, Thyristor and metal oxide varistors are some of the more common types and additional information is available on any of these on the websites listed on the slide. There are other manufacturers of lightning and surge arresters available. These are given as examples. Lightning discharges are rated at thousands of amps of current with 50% of the first strikes reaching 18 kiloamps. The largest recorded lightning strike was almost 400 Ka. A lightning strike does not have to be a direct hit to destroy equipment and often isn't. Lightning strikes are complex with secondary and upward strikes as well. Often damage is done by secondary strikes. Many manufacturers rate their components for multiple strikes or for certain amounts of breakdown current. How do you tell if a lightning arrestor is in good condition? As with many components on the tower, those that carry RF such as transmission line and connectors lightning arresters must be 50 ohms of impedance when new. One lightning strike may change the protector's impedance or it may take several strikes before being a problem. When swept using a frequency domain reflectometer, an FDR or line sweeper, the lightning arrestor should sweep to the same value as a barrel placed in the system. The first indication of failure is that RF will not be passed on the feed line. 
Sweeping the feed line in distance default mode will show the location of the bad component, and if it's a lightning suppressor in line, it must be replaced. Use the manufacturer's specifications in VISWAR or return loss to determine condition. Some models of lightning arresters do not pass DC voltage and therefore cannot be tested with a volt ohm meter. Most lightning arresters operate by taking the lightning strike from the center conductor of the coax to the outer conductor and ground. Once on the outer conductor, the lightning travels to the ground through the ground kits on the tower and feed line, protecting the equipment further down line. Because of this, grounding continues to be vitally important. Static builds up on the insulation of the feed line and other parts of the system, discharging through the systems in order to reach ground. To get the best coverage for first responders, LMR site antennas are often the highest point in the area, making the tower and antennas a target, a natural point for lightning strikes. Proper grounding on LMR sites is not just a good idea, it is a necessity. In order to reduce the potential differences that will exist between the tower, the system, the ground, and the atmosphere, all transmission lines should be bonded to the tower. This will help take lightning potential to ground through the tower rather than the feed line. This also reduces the chance of arcing between the feed lines on the tower to the tower structure and other points on the tower. Ground kit should be installed prior to testing the antenna system. Proper grounding of a feed line system on the tower requires multiple ground points with the first ground point as near to the antenna as is practical. The second ground point should be at the tower base. Depending on tower height, a ground kit needs to be installed somewhere near the midpoint in the feed line, but ground kits should be no more than 200 feet apart on any system and closer if local conditions and site drawings require. National Electrical Code requires that the feed line be grounded at the building entrance. A great deal of thought and engineering go into site design, both before and after the site is up and operating. Nothing is left to chance when first responder and public safety lives are involved. Once the coverage area is clearly defined, the number of sites needed will be established dependent upon factors such as frequency range of the system, the topography of the area, and a host of other factors. Tower locations may be limited to existing structures or available property. Height, tower type, and other considerations are now part of zoning and planned communities and regulations. Transmitter output power and antenna selection will have a major impact on coverage. Frequency planning includes what is currently in use, what is in use nearby, and what is in the system that represents a high power threat such as remaining broadcasters. TXRX Systems has been working with first responder systems since 1976, providing infrastructure products such as combiners and duplexers, antennas and tower top amplifier systems. A leading innovator in custom solutions in VHF and UHF systems, TXRX, now paired with Comblent, an international corporation, produces radio infrastructure equipment for several major OEMs in the LMR industry and has the capabilities to work with you and your team to design and supply your infrastructure equipment. TXRX Systems has a full-time staff of field service engineers and technicians ready and able to assist in solving your site issues. The field services team also works remotely with what are called SAM-NAM kits, spectrum analysis and monitoring, and noise analysis and monitoring. Before the design work begins or after the problem starts, TXRX Systems and Comblent are here to help you with your site needs. Thank you for being part of this training module. For inquiring about TXRX systems and services, and for being part of our technical community. This section was intended as a further introduction to LAN mobile radio sites, systems, and equipment. It is not intended to be an in depth training, but a continuation in the series covering site equipment. 
More training modules are available in support of this and other topics specific to products manufactured by TXRX Systems. The material is available in short versions and in longer half-day, full-day, and two-day classes. Visit our website at txrx.com for more information. Titles and topics are being added weekly, so please come back often to see what is available. Classes are held at TXRX Systems 8625 Industrial Parkway, Angola, New York, or if your group or shop is large enough, we will bring the training to you. Please call 716-549-4700 to discuss fees and scheduling. Again, thank you for being part of this presentation, and we do invite you back.